just welcoming folks. We're going to get started in a little bit. Lots of folks are just coming online, so just welcoming everybody, and uh, we'll give it a few more minutes before we get started, giving people a chance to come online with us. Thank you. So great to see so many people joining us, wonderful. And just for the presenters to know that we're going live on Facebook right now as well, Catherine was just letting me know. So welcome everyone who is uh, both joining us on Zoom, which is great. And we'll be looking for your comments and uh, questions as we go along. And also welcome everyone who's on Facebook uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to track your questions as well, but we'll try to do both. So thank you for much and we'll be, we'll be looking for you there on Facebook as well. Lots of folks saying hi in the chat. Um, you know, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, it's a good way for people to network and to get to know each other. So uh, please feel free to do that. And also, you know, continue to make comments. We'll be trying to monitor that. Uh, and we're going to get started just in a second here. Just seeing a lot of folks coming on right now. Thank you. Great, good to see people calling in from lots of different locations, thank you. So I think we'll go ahead and get started now. Um, first, I just want to say hello to everyone. My name is Osprey Oreo Lake, and I am the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, or WECAN. And welcome to uh, this really exciting time together, this conversation we're having on structuring an economy for people and planet in the time of climate crisis and COVID-19. Um, I'm zooming in from coastal Miwok territories in the San Francisco Bay area. So I just want to, to acknowledge uh, the lands that I'm on, the coastal Miwok. Um, some of you are new to WeCan, So I would just suggest that um, if you'd like, please go to our website. And Catherine, who is our communications coordinator, will be putting uh, links throughout this conversation into the chat section. Um, and also at the end, we're going to be collecting all of the, the different links from the chat and, and sending that out as part of um, resources for all of you. So you can learn also about these amazing women who are on the call with us today. Um, so I don't want to take a lot of time to talk about our organization, but I would just encourage you to go to our website if you're interested to learn about our programs, ranging from divestment and new economy, to Women for Forests, where we're working in different forest regions around the world, both reforesting and protecting old growth forests. Um, we do a lot of advocacy at the UN Climate Talks and, and a variety of work. So I just wanted to welcome you to our network, um, if this is your first time connecting with us. And I also just wanted to take a breath and really acknowledge, um, uh, you know, this time, um, you know, we've been in uh, this pandemic for some months now. And I know that 
Uh, there's a variety of ways people are experiencing this time. There's people I know who are in tremendous struggle now. A lot of the communities that we work with, there's a lot of loss and grief uh, um, for, for people and nature. Um, there's also a lot of wonderful things happening with healing of nature in different areas and a variety of ways that people are experiencing this moment from, from loss to um, learning about living in their home communities in a different way. So I just want you to know that we are here for you, that we send our love to you, that we send our care to you, and you know, that we're, we're you know, want to know that um, you know, our organization is here to, to acknowledge uh, wherever you are in the spectrum of responses and, and needs. Um, this webinar that we're having today is part of Weekend's ongoing advocacy and solution series, A Just and Healthy World is Possible. And it's part of our response to this moment. Uh, during today's webinar, women from different regions of the world will discuss alternative economics that are counteracting what we've been experiencing for a long time with extractive economic systems, colonization, racism, and patriarchy. And we know that this is part of this moment that we really have to deal with. And instead, we need to be visibilizing women's labor, center indigenous knowledge, women of color, and really prioritizing people and planet, and not just giving lip service to that, but really doing that. I don't think there could be a more important time to ensure that we don't go back to business as usual, because clearly it wasn't working. It's not working. So before I introduce this incredible panel of women, I want to make a few more contextualizing comments just to, to set the tenor of, of, of the discussion. Um, I think we realize the COVID-19 pandemic has really laid bare the already existing severe cracks in our global economic system. What is needed right now is an investment in economies founded on principles of justice, reciprocity and regeneration. And this is a moment in which we need to address that the multiple crises of this pandemic, of the climate crisis, and many other societal dysfunctions are rooted in the dominant cultures, not everyone, but the dominant cultures, disconnection and disrespect for nature and each other. And how these crises are exposing and amplifying uh, systems of injustice and inequalities. And these interlocking systems of oppression disproportionately are harming indigenous people, communities of color, women, and the land, Mother Earth herself. So, you know, often we hear that we're all in this together, but the fact is we're not in this together evenly. So as we see disaster capitalism really playing out in real time, we know we must organize and mobilize to dismantle these current structures and call for and build a regenerative rights-based economy that prioritizes communities and nature. And this is something our collective movements have been working on for a very long time. This is not new. And all of the women on this panel have been key leaders in this effort with unique actions and initiatives. So I'm really excited um, to hear from all of them. Uh, due to gender inequality, women are in fact on the front lines of the climate crisis and this current pandemic and many other problems in our society. And right now, women are making up 70% of the healthcare workers worldwide. And the majority of unpaid care workers who are bearing the brunt of this broken economic system. So women are right there. I mean, 70% of the healthcare workers and we know what they're facing right now. So we want to highlight in this discussion, the links between how capitalism is in great part based on this ongoing institutionalized patriarchy and the devaluing of women and their labor. And at WeCan, we're working in collaboration with um, some really amazing feminist groups to put forth an agenda for feminist Green New Deal, which yes, you know, we're starting here in the United States with it, but it's really a global feminist Green New Deal, which outlines key principles for a just recovery for this moment. And again, Catherine will be sharing a link to, to that website that we work on collectively so you can learn more about that. I also wanted to flag that just this April, the state of Hawaii has put forth a feminist economic recovery plan in response to the pandemic. And um, I need to read it more to find out exactly uh, the different principles they're putting forward and policies. But I do think it's really powerful that the opening statement 
of the document reads, and this is in quotes, the road to economic recovery should not be across women's backs. So that kind of gives you a flavor of, of what they're getting at. At WeCan, we are also very engaged in various divestment campaigns because we know we need to stop financial institutions from enabling the fossil fuel companies to continue to extract. And we really need to also stop these government bailouts that are happening right now to the oil and gas sector. I think it's really outrageous. Uh, you know, we, we, we're not going to be able to address this climate crisis or meet the Paris Climate Agreement if we continue to extract. We must keep fossil fuels in the ground. I mean, you know, instead, clearly, our government and everyone should be investing in people and planet at this time. And one last key piece of work that I wanted to mention for right now that we're working on has to do with rights of nature. Our current environmental laws are treating nature as property, only existing for human use as a commodity. And again, it's this dominion over nature attitude and um, a market-based solution, which we consider as false solutions. So we need to get our, our living earth, our forests, our water out of the marketplace and say our earth is not for sale, our earth is, is sacred. And the earth cannot be a subset of the economy. I mean, that's completely upside down. The, the earth can't be underneath our economic systems. And our mother earth is clearly letting us know that her natural laws are not negotiable. So I'm really excited about the conversation today because as stability in the current system falters and cracks, which, which it clearly is, this is actually a time where new ways of visioning can have a considerable impact. I mean, like this is our moment to really um, jump in like we've never done before and demand these changes. What is needed now is investment in alternative economic models predicated on community-led solutions, indigenous knowledge, and, and really ancient concepts that we need to bring forward of reciprocity with the earth and all living beings and all of us this is what we really need to envision and fight for at this time. So with that, um, I want to introduce our speakers and how we're going to run this webinar is each of them will have an opportunity to, to share their wisdom and knowledge with us about um, their work. And then we'll be opening it up for discussion at the end. And I'm going to be introducing the speakers in the order that they're going to be speaking. So first, we're going to be hearing from Ruth Nyambura. She's a Kenyan activist with the African Eco-Feminist Collective. Welcome, uh, Ruth. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, then we'll be hearing from Rauna Kuakanen. She is from the Sami Nation, and she's a research professor of Arctic Indigenous Studies at the University of Lapland, Finland. And uh, we learned that due to the time difference, she preferred to send in a video. So she sent us that, and, and it's quite powerful. So uh, she's not here with us live, but we do have her wisdom and knowledge in a video. And then we'll be hearing from Sydney Weisner. She is the executive director of Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Uh, and then we will be hearing from Ellen Brown. Um, she's an attorney and founder of the Public Banking Institute. And then we will be hearing from Melina Labacan Massimo. She's from the Lubacan Cree First Nations. Um, in so-called Canada. She's the Programs Director of Indigenous Climate Action and also the founder of Sacred Earth Solar. And then finally, last but not least, Dr. Julia Kim, who is the Program Director at Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan. So it's just an amazing lineup of women. Um, and again, we're gonna be sharing lots of knowledge uh, about the work and their organizations in the chat and also uh, a plethora of information about them and their bios on our website, as well in, as in this final document we'll be sharing out with everyone. Um, but at this point, I would like to hand the floor over to you, Ruth. Thank you so much for joining us. Please take it away. Thank you, Ruth. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me well and you can see me well. Um, so I'm not going to introduce myself uh, longer than what uh, Osprey has already said about me. Uh, other than, yes, I'm, uh, my name is Ruth Nyambura. I am a Kenyan feminist based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am part of the African Ecofeminist Collective, which is a collective of researchers, activists, organizers, 
healers across the continent and Africa working on the intersections of gender economy and ecological justice from an anti-capitalist um, perspective. And we believe in a new world, in a liberated world. And I'm very happy to be here today to speak to all of you, uh, fellow comrades, uh, brothers, sisters, fellow travelers um, in the world where in the fight, in the fight for justice uh, in whatever form that it takes for us. So um, it's actually 9.15 in Nairobi and I'm going to try and uh, be as alert as possible because I've been awake for very many hours uh, right now. So we're basically two hours into the curfew. Since um, the last week of March, if I'm not wrong, uh, the country has been under a curfew because of the pandemic. And the last time we had a curfew in Kenya was in 1982. I wasn't even born then, but it was the beginning of a really horrible time because there had been a, an attempted coup against a dictatorship. And what followed basically was the clamping down of rights in the country, the complete, almost complete annihilation of the radical thinkers, the closing of universities, the enjoyization of very radical movements and, um, and spaces. So it's very interesting to sort of see the parallels between 1982 and what we've witnessed so far. On the first day of um, the curfew, when the curfew began, uh, very famous, infamous images rather, from the coast of the country where the police in Kenya basically beat, beat up and humiliated thousands of working class, poor and working class Kenyans who rely on the ferry to move from one uh, side of the coast to the other side of the coast where they're able to provide their labor. So we've seen across the continent of Africa, uh, basically in uh, states responding to the crisis that we face, uh, a health crisis and a social crisis um, uh, being treated as being treated as a form of more surveillance, um, increasing powers of the police, and militarized responses to, um, to the crisis. But we've also seen what various feminists and activists across the continent, but across the world have been saying since uh, the beginning of neoliberal globalization in the late 70s and 80s with structural adjustment programs. We have clearly seen that in the face of the pandemic on the continent, um, health basically countries that are unable to, you know, to basically deal with the crisis because the, the health systems, the public health systems as we have them have been decimated for the last 30, 40 years because of uh, structural adjustment programs, the limiting of the state, the rise of private healthcare. And we can clearly see the impacts of that. We can clearly see how at the moment um, the virus is spreading throughout uh, informal settlements uh, across the continent, uh, across the continent of Africa, which of course has made us continue to think through uh, the politics of space, you know, who belongs in the city, you know, the lack of provision of very basic services. And this is a story that is not just in Kenya or South Africa or Tanzania or Morocco or Tunisia. This is something that we have seen across the continent, but not just the continent of Africa. I mean, we've seen what has happened in India, for example, uh, the treatment of migrant workers, you know, an almost universal treatment of, of the poor and working class across the world as already diseased. You know, and this is a sentiment that didn't begin with a with the pandemic, but rather are being surfaced, these contradictions and these realities of the disposability of particular um, categories of human beings, you know, so migrants in, in India having to walk hundreds of kilometers back home are actually being denied trains to go back home so that they can continue to labor for the middle class and the elites and corporations and continue to make profits because they're only seen as labor for uh, in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of the in the eyes of the wealthy. We are seeing in the US uh, 100,000 dead at, the, at this particular moment. You've seen the crisis in Europe where uh, it's as if the elderly have been left to die because you know the old have become this category of disposability as if their lives are useless and they're worthless. You know, So this crisis has surfaced the, basically has, has surfaced the continuities and afterlives of colonial processes in, in across, across the globe, but has also laid bare the, you know, 
the iniquities of neoliberal globalization in the last 30, 40 years. In this particular period also, we continue to learn a lot about the process of exploitation and, uh, domin and domination, you know. As I said, we've we, we, we have paid, we, we are paying, we're basically seeing who is considered disposable, you know, uh, said migrant workers, informal traders, janitors, nurses, doctors, teachers, the old, children, mothers, people of color, black people, yet their labor is still relied on by the system to make profit, you know, we are seeing the common interests of capital through all these historical moments that we've, that we've lived through across the, across the age and at this particular junction, and also the historical naturalization of gender, class, racial, and caste uh, um, caste categories and hierarchies. So we're able to see the continued processes of who's actually at the top and who's actually um, at, the, at the bottom. And we're seeing the consolidation of power. One of the sickest things about this particular period of time is seeing that the richest men and women in the world continue to get rich in this particular period of time. You know, we continue to see how the state is actively consolidating power. The growing rise of the police and the military, you know, apart from what we've seen in terms of images coming out of the US in terms of the lynching and murders of black men and women, but we continue to see that even within a pandemic, you know, the consolidation of the power of the police and the military, and we say to that, we need to abolish the police and the military because these are not spaces that uh, cannot, can be reformed because in their very nature, they were built to protect the power of the elite, um, you know, and capital, you know. So this is basically to lay bare the, the particular context that we're in. But also in addition to that, coming from the continent of Africa, because as Osprey said, it's not a pandemic in which all of us, in as much as it's like the Titanic, as they say, all of us are in this sinking ship together, but not all of us are experiencing this crisis in the same particular way. So I'll talk about the continent of Africa and we see the economic system, the continued economic exploitation uh, by the countries in the global north. You know, we continue to see uh, unfair and unequal trade deals that have particular impacts on the continent. And we say this, as I mean, Eduardo Galliano, um, was very famous in, in the sense in the sense when he said that some countries specialize in winning and some countries specialize in losing and countries on the continent of Africa and other spaces of where that have colonial legacies continue to specialize in losing because the wealth of the north the global north and in Europe has been built on the backs of our countries our land you know, beginning from 1619, you know, people call it the original, I mean, I mean, original sin of, you know, when our brothers and our sisters are stolen from the continent and taken as enslaved people uh, into the global north. So we continue to see also the continued rise of military bases, you know, that guard and safeguard the interests, the economic interests of countries in the north. And this must be highlighted because if you're to speak about changing an economic system, it's important for those of us on the continent of Africa to speak very frankly about the power of uh, the corporations, uh, the military uh, and the state in our own particular spaces. If you're really going to talk about the possibilities of uh, changing the economic system that doesn't just focus on one part of the world, but actually is alive to uh, the particularities but and context of this of the particular of uh, uh, each particular space and with that i move on to in as much as the pandemic and this and this space that we're in has shown us um has basically surfaced the contradictions of of capital but also we have seen the possibilities for autonomy and liberation because with every crisis there's always a window and an opening for new and liberated world. But some of the urgent questions, those of us who are feminists, those of us who believe in an anti-racist, anti-capitalist and anti-patriarchal world, you know, for those of us who believe in this uh, particular things, there are particular questions we need to ask ourselves. The first one is, what is our vision for liberation and what are our minimum non-negotiables? This is an urgent question for us to ask ourselves. You know, what does that liberated world look like for us? What kind of an economic system, you know, takes us to a liberated world? Of course, to begin with, capitalism makes majority of us disposable. A capitalist system cannot take us to a liberated world. It is an economic system in which the majority of us continue to fail, we continue to lose as Eduardo Galliano um, said, what are the entry points to build a transnational and transversal politics of solidarity amongst the oppressed people 
of the world. You know, when we think about an economic system, it's an economy doesn't just sit on its own. You know, we have to think about the various processes and the intersections of what builds an economy. The labor, questions of labor, questions of land. We have to liberate the land. We have to think radically about uh, land relations, social relations around land. We have to think critically about the kinds of food systems uh, that we want to have. You know, we have to think about the politics of industrial farming, you know, not just because we have seen that industrial agriculture is one of the reasons, you know, we are here in terms of this crisis. We also see how the kind of inequalities around labor in the rise of industrial agricultural practices, whether it's in the US where we've seen how uh, workers working in, you know, in poultry farms have gotten infected, but we also see, for example, how migrant workers moving from one country to another undocumented at that, still considered disposable, but still are responsible for the food production in countries. So at one point, People are disposable, but in the other point, without them, you literally cannot survive. The life-saving and affirming work that they produce. So we have to think through, you know, how do we transform a system around agriculture that degrades the land, degrades the ecosystem, degrades the climate and the environment, but also degrades people and dehumanizes uh, people, and especially not just people. You know, I must say this again, we must speak about the kinds of people who are dehumanized, indigenous people, people of color, black people, you know, poor people, working class people. So this is a system that degrades a particular kind of people who are considered non-human, you know. Further to that, you must think through a regenerative politics of care. We must think through a regenerative politics of care. And I think for me, that is what, that is the entry point to actually that is a that is a that is a basis for an economic system that gives life you know that is what we have to think about what does a politics of regeneration mean you know for ourselves in terms of how we treat each other who is human you know so again an anti-capitalist world an anti-patriarchal world a world that sees queer trans people as people and not as disposable people a world that doesn't just you know say that uh, a particular way of living and being is a right way to live and to be you know we have to think about reclaiming a politics of the commons you know it's important for us to think about to move from a privatized to privatized forms of life privatized forms of labor privatized privatized forms of being and think about how do we reclaim a radical idea of the commons with ourselves, with the world, and of course, importantly, with the land, you know, and how do we decolonize the land? How do we decolonize our relations with one another? And that's important. And finally, I will finish with um, a line that I really love. This was, um, if I'm not wrong, I think I believe I'm not wrong. So Bernice Regan Johnson, said this, but Ella Baker sang it, we who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ruth, and um, your beautiful, powerful words of wisdom, and of course, analysis, which we deeply welcome. And also, I just wanted to acknowledge that it's late your time, and we really appreciate that you stayed up late to be with us. It means a lot to us for, for your time and labor to, to interact in this important conversation. And we need to hear from you and you know our sisters around the world that we can't have this liberation we want. We have to do it together. So thank you for being with us. I really appreciate it. And you know, just to also um, highlight that um, you know, when we're talking about a feminist solution, we are talking across the gender spectrum. Um, for everyone being included, um, and also that, you know, to also highlight this elitism and white supremacy is also what we're trying to get at because it's interlocking with this, this economic system. So thank you for highlighting that and our, our, um, our effort to, to liberate at so many levels. So thank you for those powerful words. And now we're going to hear from Rauna Kuakana from the Sampi Nation in Finland. And again, you know, um, she was unable to join us. So we have this short video from her. If you could go ahead and key that up. Thank you so much. Catherine, if you'll take us away. Thank you. Kore päivi, mulla on Jouna Jonanne Kirsti Räynä. Puhtan tervoa tai saamis ja kiihtän läidätki pouteusas. I'd like to thank the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network for hosting this timely and important webinar in these difficult times. I'm honored to be invited to join the other speakers, although I had to do it as a pre-recorded talk due to the time difference between the West Coast and SAPMI. 
My, uh, the title of my short talk is Building a New World in the Ruins of the Old One, a Gift Economy and Indigenous Worldviews. The corona pandemic has given the world a jolt and sent the world economy into a downward spin. The human costs of the pandemic are terrifying and the social and economic inequality, both locally and globally, has been highlighted by the impacts of the pandemic. On the other hand, it has also been deeply inspiring to see how the response has largely been characterized by new levels of empathy, care, compassion and connection. Another silver lining has been what looks like the sharpest ever cut in the level of global carbon emissions. The question many people are asking is whether the pandemic is going to help us in tackling climate change. There are no simple answers to this question. A crisis in itself does not guarantee anything and we need to remember that corporations and capital have already started planning how to profit from the crisis and the recovery efforts. As others have noted, Governments will go along with those plans unless forced by society to do otherwise. Society in opposition to big capital needs to find ways both to tackle climate change and to pursue social justice. In short, we have a great opportunity to insist on basing social and climate justice at the heart of global recovery efforts. As many people suggest, what happens over the coming months could go one of two ways. There is a risk that corporations and governments exploit the crisis to push for more drastic cuts and austerity measures for their profit, as they have done a number of times before. But there's another path. We can seize this moment as a golden opportunity to rebuild society and economy as we want it. This, however, requires a radical economic and political change of the global uh, scale. As Naomi Klein points out, Climate change can't be solved within the confines of the status quo because it is a product of the status quo. What is needed in her view is managed degrowth. I feel like we are collectively and individually on the edge of a cliff and it's up to us to decide whether we want to take the leap or stay on this side. There's great potential on the other side and it's not too far off to jump. What are the things that we want to take with us from our previous lives, and what do we want to leave behind? The current economic system is based on capitalist exchange, naturalized as the self-evident norm. It is built on the exploitation of cultural traditions and knowledge of free or unilateral gifts of the land and of cheap labor, especially in the global south. The exchange economy encourages artificial scarcity and funnels the gifts of many into the hands of the few. Artificial scarcities make it difficult, if not impossible, to practice a gift economy. On top of this, capitalist ideology has declared giving and sharing to be irresponsible, except when practiced within highly limited parameters, such as charity, which does not challenge the exchange logic. In contemporary society, the gift is also commodified and appropriated by consumer capitalism. The notion of the gift as a commodity is especially valuable and profitable for the advertising and marketing sectors. In today's materialist and market-oriented society, the value of the gift is no longer measured in terms of its capacity to establish and maintain social relationships in and with the world, including the land, but rather in terms of its monetary value. This inflated and transformed definition of the gift has become the dominant one in the minds of many people uh, in modern society. Feminist philosopher Genevieve Vaughan has called for the validation and restoration of gift giving as a basic human principle. Besides being part of the current economic model, hierarchy, domination and violence are also elements of the dominant masculine identity. Vaughan points out that we are all born into the gift economy of mothering. Nurturing mothers practice unilateral giving to their children. However, as scholars have demonstrated, boys in mainstream society must then construct their male identities in opposition to their mothers. They are expected to disassociate themselves from the values and practices of nurturing, care, and gift giving. Like women's mothering and domestic labor, giving and its values have been rendered inferior in Western society. Living in a market-based society makes us think of all bonds in ter terms of exchange, of debts and repayment, Yet the fact is that the gift paradigm is present in all our lives. 
Vaughan suggests that if everyone were giving to everyone else, there would be no uh, need to exchange. What we must do is restore the principle of mothering as the basis of humanity and reestablish giving, gift giving as the key social value. And what this um, uh, principle of mothering means is that we must generalize the values of nurturing and care so that they apply to both men and women, rather than use the gift paradigm to justify the exploitation of women and their domestic labor. Also, we can reorganize the institutions and structures of society to reflect the principles of gift giving. For example, by eliminating uh, the rewards that accompany dominance and hierarchy. For me, the gift is the foundation of an indigenous worldviews, characterized by uh, the perception that the natural environment is a living entity which gives its gifts and abundance to people, provided that we observe certain responsibilities and provided that we treat it with respect and gratitude. Central to this perception is that social ties apply to everyone and everything, including the land. In, in indigenous worldviews that foreground relationships with the land, the gift is the means uh, through which the social order is renew renewed and secured. The gift is the manifestation of reciprocity with the natural environments. It reflects the bond of dependency and respect toward the natural world. In this system, one does not give primarily in order to receive, but rather in order to ensure the balance of the world on which the well-being of the entire social order, especially human people, is contingent. Thanks are given in the form of gifts to the land and its guardians who sustain human beings. According to uh, common indigenous ethics, reciprocity among people often takes the form of circulation. One gives something to uh, another, who in turn gives something else to a third person. There is no expectation of a counter gift, counter gift of equal value. Because sharing and giving form the basis of the community's well-being, receiving from others who have something to share is considered normal. This understanding is based on an ethical worldview that recognizes the importance of interdependence and relationality instead of prioritizing the independence of the individual. In these worldviews, the strings attached to gifts do not exist in the same way as enclosed two-way giving between two individuals. Many people are already experimenting on rebuilding the household and community non-monetary economies of barter, reciprocity, gift and love. I suggest that there is an urgent need for a new interpretation of the gift, or perhaps a new interpretation uh, drawing on the old one, that enables us to question our predominant values and our needs. In many indigenous societies, there is a common norm to only take what you need. I think at this particular juncture, we must also reconsider what our needs are. This idea like, what, do you, what is it that we want to take with us if you're gonna jump on the other side of the cliff? I think that need has become too an elastic concept. We need a new pair of shoes to cheer ourselves up. We need a vacation in a faraway place. Instead of, instead of thinking in terms of need, uh, we should be think, uh, thinking in terms of what we cannot live without. We can live, live without, without, uh, with those, uh, uh, without those uh, new shoes. We can live out uh, that uh, vacation in a faraway place. But what is it that we cannot live without? To conclude, the gift offers an alternative to the current paradigm of consumerism, self-interest and hyper-individualism. It involves a transformation of perspective, as well as a paradigm shift in the values we apply when critiquing our relationships in and with the world. Keitu, thank you very much for this opportunity to share with you today. Take care, keep safe everyone, and let's start from re recognizing the gifts all around us. Great, uh, thank you. That was so powerful and I'm sure we will be getting back to Rauna and you know giving her our thanks and just to really highlight all the incredible work that she's doing um, from an indigenous perspective on uh, economics. And I think this whole idea of, you know, there's so many wonderful things she said, but also just to highlight this idea of 
giving and sharing and caring economy that's not about getting something back is so not what our culture teaches us. And it's just one point I wanted to, to pull forth, um, you know, as we are looking at new economics and new ways of being together and with our earth. And with that, I'm very excited to bring Sydney Weisner on. Thank you so much, Sydney. Please go ahead. Uh, greetings, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Cindy Weisner. I work with Grassroots Global Justice Alliance. Uh, we're members of the Climate Justice Alliance and the Green New Deal table and the People's Bailout. Um, I'm really grateful um, for We Can and the other sisters and kin kinfolk who are organizing this conversation. Um, I want to take a moment of recognition and rage. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, nearly uh, 100,000 people have died uh, of uh, COVID, and over a million and a half people are sick. And globally, um, about 355,000 people have also perished because of COVID. Um, I would be remiss without actually mentioning what's happening here um, in Minneapolis. Uh, with the uprisings um, that are, are being led because of the murder of George Floyd, um, who is a victim of white supremacy, of police murder, um, and really standing um, with our Black brothers and sisters and kinfolk at this moment, because this is coming in the wave of the murder of the vigilante murder of Ahmaud Aubrey in Georgia and Breonna Taylor in Kentucky and, and many more um, along that list. And um, so to talk at this moment of, um, you know, about what's possible. I want to start off with a quote uh, by Grace Lee Boggs, the legendary activist and teacher from Detroit. And she states that in the middle of a catastrophe, in the middle of disaster, people, particularly who have already suffered, see an opportunity to evolve to another stage of humanity. And I take these words very seriously because we're in a moment where we have to be strategic we have to be making assessments and we have to be building the coherence and alignment of our diverse sectors of society. And that we also have to understand that um, millions of people have been very rapidly ra radicalized in this period of the pandemic. Um, we've known entering the pandemic, there were multiple colliding crises. And I think we're at this crossroads about how we see, um, you know, the trend either going towards global authoritarianism or something completely new. And many of us in the movements believe that now is the moment to think about the whole reorganization of society. Because what seemed impossible two months ago in the United States I think is now becoming common sense. There's a new barometer of what common good and common sense means. There's moratoriums on rent and mortgages. There's uh, the uh, student debts that are being uh, frozen. There's the freeing of people locked in cages and jails and detention centers. There's workers um, that are demanding hazard pay and, and sick leave and people demanding um, a people's bailout and not a bailout of corporations. And I think this is an opportunity that for many of us who've been working decades to really reimagine a new model, right? A new political, economic, cultural model and that we cannot go back to what is considered normal. That is, um, I think the biggest uh, challenge and question before us. So there are, um, you know, I think that overnight um, there was a what, what what had been invisible, undervalued, underpaid from domestic work, child rearing, food production, um, from growing it to making it, selling it to healthcare. What we would call reproductive labor is now completely visible, and the fact and, and the fact of the matter is it's what's keeping us alive. So part of the opportunity right now is shifting the patriarchal frameworks, policies and practices, and replacing those policies and uh, uh, practices and frameworks with ethics of care and collectivism, like the other sisters have uh, shared, and really putting life at the center of the economy and not capital. And so we've seen decades of neoliberal austerity with the cutting back of the social safety net, right? The right wing's attempt to dismantle the state as we know it. Um, we've seen increases of xenophobia, 
Christian white supremacists running, um, you know, sort of uh, the countries and, and seeing that play out um, globally. And we also see that free markets uh, solutions and bailing out corporations is not going to solve the magnitude of this crisis. And particularly climate deniers and pandemic deniers are, are, are worsening, right? So I would say there's three main dangers um, at this moment. Um, individualism and nationalism as one category. The second is this whole going back to normal because at that stage is that there's certain classes of people and that are racialized and gendered that are ba basically being dis designated as disposable. And then there's demands and policies that strengthen the current system, right? Like strengthen capitalism and strengthen imperialism. So there's three paths forward that I would like to offer that actually um, complement what I think the, the previous speakers also have shared is that one, that solidarity is one of our main solutions. And within that, within our organization, we talk a lot about grassroots internationalism. And that is a way of which we have to be able to challenge those nationalist authoritarian tendencies and break down borders in this moment and really think about how do we, how do we not just work and stand on the issues that we care about, but now is a moment to actually think about a multiplicity of the things that are just and unjust that we must not let anyone be sacrificed. This is a moment that no one gets thrown under the bus and that we, in these attempts to go back to normal, we know that it's not, it's the working class people, it's uh, women, it's uh, young people, it's folks in a precarious scenarios that then are gonna then give the haircuts or serve the food. And then we see that that's in the name of going back to re reopening the economy. And we must not let anyone be sacrificed. And then the third path forward is really about transformative demands and vision. And that ultimately we gotta be thinking about the implementing of systemic alternatives that also dismantle white supremacy and patriarchy um, because we can't just do it without that context. What's happening in Minneapolis cannot be seen separate from actually what's happening in the COVID um, pandemic globally. So we have to understand that there will be a global recession and a global depression. And I think we need to prepare for that, the long view about, about this situation, right? And we need to be able to not just think about immediate relief, but how we rebuild and how do we rebuild on our terms. And so part of that is that we know that there's gonna be a lot of need and there has been responses around mutual solidarity, but I, I think it has to begin to talk and then that social solidarity, but we gotta be able to think about what does large scale structural change also look at at this moment. So we see that, um, you know, like the Ruth said, that, that they're in the crisis, the neoliberal right wing is gonna use militarism and surveillance and take things out of, um, you know, try to put things into the private market and out of public hands. And we need to be able to think about what is this moment where we actually decommodify, right? Where we actually, um, I ag really agree with the demands, make demands around the commons, um, public ownership of cor corporations, redefining what safety means, right? And having government for the common good. And uh, like Rana said, really, value and put forward the need of interdependence because we need each other, right? We need each other in our communities, in our homes globally. And that there is this um, importance of being able to also think about how we, 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 we put in place these systemic alternatives that are so needed. So we come from a movement in the environmental justice movement that talks about just transition to a regenerative economy. And I would add from our perspective, a just transition to a regenerative feminist economy. And so part of that just transition is knowing that we have to move away from the extractive model towards a more just regenerative one that leaves no one behind and that it really repairs the historical and systematic uh, systemic harms that have been perpetuated on and uh, on oppressed people and communities. And that we know that we have to have again women, gender non-conforming, queer, trans people of color in the U not only in the US, but globally at the forefront of this. And I think that's one of the things that's really important that in this multiracial front, 
towards a, towards building the new, we need to be able to articulate what does that actually look like. Um, so we've been putting forward um, these principles within grassroots global justice's work, uh, uh, principles of a feminist economy. And there's four components. Um, one is that we ensure bodily autonomy and self-determination, right? The importance of being able to, the, the body as the first site of of uh, struggle in a lot of ways. Um, our territory, our first body, our, our body as a first territory of defense and protection. The second is around socializing reproductive labor. We believe that it's completely possible to re-socialize people so that it's, there's not the gender division of labor within the home, right? And that there's also a re-socialization of reproductive labor at the global level too, when we think about global division of labor and sexual division of labor at a global level. Um, and I think that's really important that there is an opportunity to socialize the uh, reproductive labor, that we need to be in right relationship with people and we need to be in right relationship to nature. And those are some important um, components that begin to talk about what is, what are then we, how do we develop again, poli uh, frameworks, policies and practices around that. And how do we, and then, center the role of gender in the economy and that it, it recognizes the gendered impacts. When we have an extractive war making economy, what are the impacts that, that what is, does that lead us to, right? What does it lead when we see, you know, toxic chemicals and pollutants jeopardizing our health um, and the disproportionate impact it has on black, indigenous, Latinx people and gender and women and gender non-conforming folks because of environmental racism. We see the man camps in mining towns as a site of gendered violence, like uh, in the epidemic of missing and murdered native women and girls. And so part of this, if we begin to shift and have a paradigm that begins to center you know, a feminist economy, we then think about the centrality of reproductive labor that um, again, historically and predominantly is performed by women that's unpaid by women of color, immigrant women, low wage workers, and in that. So all of this to say is that we have an opportunity, right? We have an opportunity in the deep sort of crises, multiple colliding crises that we were in, we have an opportunity to really think about and how do we push boldly for a divestment from this extractive war making economy and a real investment in a regenerative feminist economy that uh, upholds the rights of mother earth, that honors, um, that makes reparations to communities that have been disproportionately harmed and that we work to reproduce ourselves and our communities in a very different way where, we're, where our, our, we are recognized, we are valued, where we are happy instead of in this level of isolation. And so I think again, to repeat the three points that solidarity is our solution, that we must not let anyone be sacrificed and that this is an opportunity for transformative demands and vision and implementing that systemic alternative based on uh, a system that challenges both right supremacy and patriarchy. Thank you. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Cindy, for that really brilliant analysis and laying that out. It's really powerful. And um, thank you very much for joining us. And I know that we could delve into a lot of these areas so more deeply. So thank you for, you know, concisely laying that out for us. I really appreciate that. And now we're going to move to Ellen Brown. Please take us away, Ellen. Hi. Uh, so it's great to be talking to you all. I'm, I'm uh, already enjoyed these presentations. I agree with Sydney. What we need is uh, solidarity. So I'm the chairman of the Public Banking Institute, and I've written a number of books on public banking and banking in general. So I want to suggest a way that we can move forward politically uh, to actually change our economic system. Uh, it's true that the rich are getting richer now from this crisis and obviously they're getting richer at the expense of the poor they're exploiting as as always and what's allowing them to exploit is the federal reserve in the united states anyway the federal reserve has reduced the interest rates for banks to borrow to zero so they're essentially borrowing for free 0.25 percent from the from the federal reserve discount window 
and they've set up all these uh, special purpose vehicles that I won't try to describe, but there's the, these new vehicles that allow corporations to sell their toxic bonds or toxic assets to, to the Federal Reserve and to the Treasury. And so we, the people, are backstopping this thing. We put up the capital for it. And uh, that facility is being used for big corporations, but we, the people, are not getting the benefit of it. And uh, we're back in the situation of the, uh, uh, the Great Depression. So we've got uh, unemployment of 24%, which is about what it was in the Great Depression. And what we need then is a stimulus program of the sort that Roosevelt used during the Great Depression. And what, how he did it, all the banks were bankrupt at that time. So you couldn't borrow from the banks. So what he did was set up his own a uh, public bank, publicly owned. It was not actually a bank. It was called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and it was set up by Hoover, but Roosevelt expanded the possibilities of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He started with $500 million and over 25 years lent out $40 billion. So just basically mobilizing credit. Uh, he sold bonds or the Reconstruction Finance Corporation sold bonds but who bought them? Most of them were bought by the federal government. And of course, the federal government didn't have the money. It was just, it was all created on the books as a form of debt. And through, through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, they funded every, anything that was what was called self-funding, anything that would pay back like railroads, things that would you could charge fees for and pay back the loans. So farms, dams, um, power plants, anything that was self-funding, any that sort of infrastructure um, was funded through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And it was also used during World War, World war II to fund our participation in the war. And at the end of that, after 25 years, when it was finally terminated under a, um, a Republican administration, it had turned a profit for the government, rebuilt the country, and basically won a war uh, with nothing, starting with nothing, basically with credit, credit created on the books of banks. And we now know that all banks, the banks basically create our money supply. 95% of our money supply is created by banks when they make loans. They're, it's not created by the Treasury or the Federal Reserve. Uh, I won't try to explain how that is, but when you take out a loan, basically they just write it into your account and that's where, and those are called deposits. When the deposit moves into another bank, it's a new deposit, so it's counted in the money supply and that's where all our money comes from. So meanwhile, the banks, which are getting this great, great deal right now, borrowing for free, are not passing that benefit on to us. The uh, credit card rates are still uh, averaging 21%. They, they dropped it by a half a percent. And in Canada, they actually dropped the rates to 11%. So that just shows it can be done. If the banks wanted to benefit the people, they could do it. But there were no strings attached to, to this free credit. And, you know, if the banks aren't made to do it, they don't do it. Their, their mandate is to make as much money as they can for their creditors. And that's what they do. Um, so what can we do? And, um, and states as well are getting a raw deal. They, if states go to the, there is a facility where states can now borrow from the Federal Reserve, but it's at a penalty rate. So it's at the market rate, which is already quite high because nobody seems to want municipal bonds these days, plus a penalty rate. So we are being pen penalized as if it's the state's fault that they're in trouble while the banks are getting a free ride. So what, how can we jump on, how can we get the benefits of this free credit, uh, establish our own banks? So uh, obviously we individually can't establish our own banks, but our states, our cities, our tribes, our, you know, a public bank, what we're calling a public bank is anything that's owned by um, the people through their local government. So it could be uh, states, counties, cities, a nation, um, tribal, et cetera. Uh, right now, we, we currently have one, one state on bank. That's the Bank of North Dakota. I started writing about it in late 2008 because I knew they were the only state that had their own bank. So I was watching it and it turned out it was the only state that escaped the credit crisis. They, had the, they never went in the red. They had the lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest default rate, the lowest foreclosure rate. 
the most local banks per capita, they actually work with the local banks so that the Bankers Association endorses the Bank of North Dakota. Um, and uh, in two th after 2008, it was China that actually pulled the global economy out of a disastrous recession in, in the same way that China has 80% of their banking assets are publicly owned. So their, their banks are mostly public, publicly owned, state owned. So they use the bank to generate credit. The, so the state will borrow their credit from their own bank, but the credit is just created on the books of the bank. Then they build something like a railroad and then the fees from the railroad pay back the loan and that's the way it works. And that's how they got the, their economy stimulated. In fact, globally, 25% of banking assets are publicly owned. So we're, we're probably one of the few countries that doesn't really have this, uh, this idea of publicly owned banks. So that's what we're pushing for in the uh, Public Banking Institute. I mean, we're just a 501c3 nonprofit. We can't do political lobbying, et cetera. But we can spread this idea. And again, it's the type of thing that we just need. Uh, we need the people to get together and first of all, understand what we're talking about here and to get your legislators to do it. They can do it if they, if they understand the principle. So that's, that's why I keep talking about it. Um, so, th so that's one possibility is to form our own banks. And then another would be quantitative easing for the people. The Federal Reserve has generated six trillion dollars in this recent bailout and most of it is going to big corporations big banks etc there is no reason they couldn't generate another six trillion for the people uh, you would think that might be inflationary but china actually increased its money supply by 1800 percent in other words they have 18 times more money in the money supply now than they had 20 years ago and it's not inflationary. Their their interest rate as is this has remained stable throughout throughout that that 20 years. Japan has uh, their their central bank has bought 50% of the federal of their uh, national debt, and they their credit their interest sorry their um, inflation rate is so low they can't it's at like one percent they can't even get it up to two percent which they're trying for. So we could pump a lot more money into the economy and it would be good for the economy. It would stimulate the economy. The problem now is all the money's getting pumped into the financialized economy. We actually have two economies. There's the financialized economy and the real economy and the real productive economy where most of us are is starving for credit, starving for money. Whereas the financial economy is, things are inflating there, which they're perfectly happy about, you know, to see the stock market go up, 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 et cetera but that money is not trickling back into the real economy. So what we need to do, there's a, a, a massive gap between debt and the money available to repay it. And that debt, that gap just keeps growing and growing. And this has happened for hundreds of years where eventually the gap gets too big the people can't pay the debts. The whole thing collapses. The rich who have some money left buy up all the assets at fire sale prices and then rent them back to the poor at you know inflated prices, and that's how the rich just keep getting richer, and that's called the it's called the business cycle. Is if it's something natural, but it's not. It's because of the way our money system is structured, and it, it used to be like five thousand years ago, in ancient Sumeria and Babylon, Babylon, they would um, have debt jubilees where they the because the credit was issued by the king and by the center, by the um, temple in a religious society, uh, they could forgive the debts periodically so that they'd have all the slaves who were you know, uh, debt slaves, they'd send them back to the farms to work on work the land, which is where they really wanted them. They didn't really want them in debt. But we can't do that today because the creditors are, are not the king. <laughs> the creditors are private and you can't just wipe off all their debts because then they will be you know, bankrupt or whatever, they'll be in, in my, many of the creditors, they're just individuals, ordinary people, et cetera. So the other alternative is to fill that gap between money and the, I mean, debt and the money available to repay it is to pour some money in. And Milton Friedman said that, the economist Milton Friedman said this decades ago, that it was easy to cure a deflation. Um, 
just fly over the people and drop money on them through from helicopters. And this got the derogatory term of helicopter money, but it's true. That's what they need to do is fly over the people or electronically drop money into our bank accounts every month. The, the gap, the actual gap between debt and the money that people earn is $1,200 a month. So if you put $1,200 a month into everybody's bank account, all adults, uh, month after month after month, you would not create inflation. You would just stabilize the system. And I've written extensively to show this, but I won't try, I won't try to demonstrate it here. But those, those are just some ideas of things we could do if we could get control of our legislators, if we could get political control. And for that, we need a massive grassroots push from the people. That's what they'll listen to is if they have a huge demand for the, from the people. And for that, you know, everybody has to understand what it is we're pushing for. Of course, it's, that's not the only thing we're pushing for, but I feel that we need you know, a grassroots movement that incorporates all these various movements that, that serve the people. It'd be great if we could form another political party, but the problem is we, we've never pulled that off yet. There's never been a third party that, or at least not in the last hundred years, we've never defeated the, the, two, the two big parties that are both controlled by big money. But anyway, that's, so that's, that's about all I have to say for now, but happy to answer questions. Um, our, our website, if you're interested, is publicbankinginstitute.org, and I have a number of books on this subject. Thank you so much, Ellen, and um, I want to bring on Melina in a second, but I just want to say when we get to the Q&A, I think one of the things I know from a lot of our analysis from a feminist perspective is also um, you know, really interesting about these public banks. I know we're working on one here in San Francisco is People also want to know when we come back to you later about, you know, we don't want to just keep having an endless economic growth system. So what you're offering is, you know, sort of helping us bridge, you know, how we get money to the poor, so to speak, and not out of, you know, the corporate hands, but also how do we change the system from your perspective? I mean, this is a step, but also like we want to encourage degrowth. We want to stop materialism. So, you know, there's a whole other component maybe you could help us look at as well. And now I want to thank you so much. I want to go to Melina Labakam Massimo. Thank you so much, Melina, for joining us. I know you're on a tight schedule. Thank you for taking your time with us. Take us away, Melina. It's an honor and privilege to be on such an amazing panel of women from around the world um, with such an amazing, diverse um, expertise um, and knowledge, wealth of knowledge. So thank you, We Can, for inviting me to share um, our perspectives from here up north in so-called Canada. I'm Lubukon Cree from Northern Alberta, and I'm currently um, seeking in, in shelter in place in um, unceded Coast Salish territory in Kluhu's First Nation. So thank you. And I'm going to actually have some visual aids for my presentation to show some photos and then I'll go into a couple of closing thoughts but if we can cue the um, visual aids for our viewers that would be so great. So I'm going to be talking about um, the macrocosm of the micro the microcosms of the macrocosms that we're talking about just to give um, voice to story of indigenous peoples and our hidden history a lot of the times unfortunately. Um, so really quickly just to ground um, who I am as an indigenous person on Turtle Island. Um, I come from a Cree Nihiao community and this is actually my dad in the left side. He is a small child that was hidden from the colonial genocidal policies of the Indian agents that came in and stole the children and he was hidden by my cookum down below uh, before she passed away and my grandfather who um, were actually all language carriers and language speakers and didn't actually speak English. So that was my grandmother and grandfather. Um, we are from the Boreal Forest, next slide. We are from the Boreal and um, if you go to the next slide, I don't know if it's frozen, hopefully not. Okay, and we are from the Boreal, so um, I'm guessing some folks have heard of the tar sands, but for those who haven't, who are from different parts of the world that are listening in, we are from one of the biggest industrial projects on the space of the planet, which um, feeds um, the global addiction um, of, to oil from our homelands where I was born, and then also to America. Next slide. Next, and so just to show the kind of microcosm to the bigger expansion project um, of refinery cancer alleys, um, refinery communities, and um, 
pipelines and then also shipping into the beautiful ocean across um, with all of the oil spills that we've heard about. So next slide. So this is just giving context to the um, just transition work that I've been doing. Um, you can see here, this is actually what is the precipice of why I started to start to do just transition and kind of looking at different types of indigenous economies of because we actually experienced a massive oil spill, one of the biggest in Canada's, um, Canada's and Alberta's history where we're from. And it would just basically took over a part of our homeland and it was hard for people to breathe. Um, people, the school was shut down. People were really sick um, for a number of weeks into months and it took a number of years to clean this up. And even later, you can see me still pulling up um, toxic sludge when it said it was clean. So these are the types of contexts that we live in here in Northern Alberta. Next slide. Um, you can see the impact obviously is not just to the air and to the water, it's also to the people and to the animals, the four-legged ones. Um, these are my cousin's children. The children weren't taken from the community. Um, the children weren't, the medical system and the government didn't uh, didn't give the information to the community. We actually had to dig it up and demand it. Um, and so it was, people were left to their own devices to protect themselves, kind of like we see with COVID-19 in a lot of communities where we, um, have impact to small Indigenous communities still. Next slide. So this is just the context of, um, yeah, land, dis land disturbance, climate change, climate crises in the era of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which we'll continue to see more of, um, but we are seeing um, land disturbance from the boreal forest, which is the northern lungs of Mother Earth, uh, caribou extinction and extirpation from the land, and also glacier fed water systems that are being drained and then toxified, um, which is a sixth of Canada's fresh water supply. Next slide. And so what we can see here is a cultural, so giving this context of what we're building, um, a, a new green economy is in this cult, cultural context of a cultural and environmental genocide where we have encroachment upon our homelands and resulting in a loss of traditions, what we're, which we're trying to recover and revitalize at concurrently while trying to protect land, while trying to build a new economy, a new um, structuring, um, a new way of living in a regenerative economy. So next slide. Hi, Claudia. And uh, this is what the next slide, I know what the next slide is. I think there's a little bit of a delay, but this is what um, the landscapes are being replaced by in our territories when we are trying to rebuild. Um, we are um, you know, facing one of the biggest industrial projects on the face of the planet. So oil spills, um, you know, intense weight, intense health conditions. Um, it's just, it's a very difficult place to live and be from. Next slide. So in the context of that, in why we are as Indigenous peoples north of the medicine line, um, are, why do we want to build a just recovery? What does a just recovery look like? What does a just transition look like to energy sovereignty? Um, next slide, please. So what we decided to do, oh, also this, um, including one quick point of an Indigenous perspective and our world, you know, our philosophy, our worldview is um, much more alignment with renewable energy technology um, because it is looking at regenerative reciprocal relationships with Mother Earth once again, because I think what we've really seen and what we've heard other speakers speak to is that we are out of alignment with Mother Earth because we are out of alignment with our relationship with her. And so from Indigenous perspective, trying to bring in um, new, new technologies, but also returning to ways, our traditional ways of being, um, you know, uh, food, like food secure, um, the ways that we've actually have lived on our land for millennia that have been stripped and the social fabric being stripped of our of our nations because of colonial policy and now we're building those back in. So this is some of the work that we've been doing up north here. If you go to the next slide. Um, Community-based solar initiatives. Um, I'll give you an example of, of my homeland. Um, we, call, we build a project called Pitapan, which in our language means the, the building of a new era, the building of a new dawn. Um, so if you go to the next slide, you'll see photos of the first time ever we've had solar panels in where I was born in the Buffalo and Lubacon Creek territory. We 
we shipped them in, we ordered them, we fundraised for it, and we started building a 20.8 um, kilowatt system. You can see Carlton here, he was from the community and he was 21 at the time and we trained young people to build the solar project with us, which actually powers our health center. If you go to the next slide. Um, you can see we did a top of pole mount system, which essentially um, right in front of, so right to the front um, or behind, I guess, from this perspective is this community school where um, kids go from kindergarten to grade 12. So every day they see solar panels. Um, it was the first time um, most people had ever actually seen solar panels in real life. Even my, my auntie who was in her seventies um, when we had the solar launch, she said, well, I never thought I'd see solar panels in my life. Um, I only seen them on TV. And so, you know, bringing these types of um, technologies to communities that are always, again, always at the end of the line to receive. So that's why we wanted to bring what a just transition looks like to us is actually communities that are facing the brunt of environmental degradation, facing the brunt of climate change to receive these types of transition technologies first, as opposed to last, which is usually the case. Um, in our community anyways, because we were the, we just received running water um, within this past number of years. And my dad, who's the chief, just, we just put the, put running water in. Like I grew up in that community and my family grew, you know, lived for, well, in Canada, there's running water everywhere. It's so this, this pattern of, of the lack of, um, equity and the lack of sharing of resources, even though the, the majority of resources and revenues comes from our homelands, it leaves our homelands, but it doesn't come back. And so for me, this is what um, a just transition looks like of communities that are actually um, at the brunt of the environmental degradation, inability to breathe, inability to live clean um, in clean lands um, to be able to receive these technologies to start transitioning out of um, our dependency on oil. If you go to the next slide, um, so that's the final installation. You can go to the next slide. It's powering our health center. Let's see here. The next slide is yeah, the young children who are five um, at the time, you know, will see this, this solar installation powering our community for 30, you know, 25, 30 years by the time they're um, my age or older. Next slide. And we had a solar feast, a solar la launch to kind of to bring it in um, culturally, um, a ribbon cutting ceremony where people were really excited. That's the first time I really, really cried tears of joy of being so excited about the potential of change in our territories. Next slide. So what we decided to start continue to do um, is I think why we are facing an era of climate change is because the lack of climate literacy, the lack of energy literacy that exists within all communities, indigenous or non-indigenous. And so bringing indigenous liter um, climate literacy workshops into communities. So this is me and Little Buffalo um, talking to the young, um, young children about wind power, solar power, what it means. You know, they were really excited. And I think we need to start at these ages of, of them learning about different types of technologies as opposed to the only job that's offered to them when they graduate is in the oil and gas industry at this point in time. So that's why we trained young people to really think about, oh, maybe I can put up solar projects. Maybe I can become a solar electrical engineer. Um, so these ideas of different types of um, avenues that are out there for getting involved in green jobs and a green economy. So we go to the next slide. Um, what I decided to do with, so Lubicon Solar was that first project and then um, learning from how to implement projects, I decided to start Sacred Earth Solar, which um, brings indigenous um, renewable energy to other indigenous communities that are hoping to implement um, that all, but don't have the expertise. Um, and so for me, I was privileged in the sense of doing my master's degree on solar and so learning about transition technologies. And so for me, I work in solidarity as a, as a climate and energy campaigner for many years with other indigenous communities that are opposing fossil fuel expansions um, that are, and especially that are connected to our homelands because it, as you saw, the tentacle that is across Turtle Island um, affects so many of us um, from coast to coast to coast. And so we built another, uh, a couple more solar project, a couple other solar projects here in Sequetmeg territory that with the Tiny House Warriors. If you want to watch more videos around um, any of this work, you can go to Sacred Earth Solar, Sacred Earth Thought Solar. And then if you go to the next slide, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, project 
um, that folks can watch online. It's called Power to the People. And we filmed in 26 locations across Turtle Island from coast to coast in indigen different indigenous communities that are already implementing renewable energy systems. Um, and so we went to, uh, to see large scale wind, solar, um, biomass, district energy, geo exchange, wave technology, tidal energy. Um, so I think there's this uh, misconception that um, in indigenous communities or in communities uh, in general aren't doing this transition, um, that this transition, and it's just not true. Um, we have over 2,300 indigenous um, renewable energy projects across so-called Canada and 180 large scale, like revenue generating utility size um, renewable energy projects in indigenous communities and territories across uh, so-called Canada. So we. Indigenous peoples are leading this charge. Um, a lot of times we don't see the stories being uplifted of this leadership. And so that's why um, we decided to build, uh, I decided to be a part of this TV show called Power to the People where I'm hosting and talking to and other Indigenous peoples that have implemented these types of projects of projects that are up and running and transitioning their communities off of diesel um, and just looking at food security systems as well as eco housing, which um, brings about resili resiliency and back into our communities, healing back into our communities. And so you can go to powertothepeople.tv to learn more about that um, and all the stories that we um, were able to profile on that project. So yeah, the last slide is just um, more information about where you can find more information about um, Indigenous climate action and sacred or solar and the stories um, that I quickly tried to share here today. And um, you can take this slide off and I was just gonna follow up with a couple of closing remarks um, just in as we close out um, this webinar. Um, so I th think really I wanted to speak really quickly to um, what this virus is telling us during this time. And I really think I've heard this and it really resonated with me that Mother Earth, Mother Earth is literally sending us to our rooms and, and saying, think about what you have done because Mother Earth is out of balance because our relationship is out of balance with her. And how do we write this relationship? How do we take care of the most vulnerable in our society? How do we stop the disrespect of Mother Earth which is inherently linked to the disrespect of women because violence against women begets violence, violence against the earth begets violence against women and these systems of patriarchy and domination that exploit the land, exploit women and the most vulnerable. And I, you know, I won't go into this because a lot of uh, the other women on the this webinar have talked so eloquently about it, but I really think globalization has undermined our capacity to be self-sufficient and at times to adequately even respond to these crises that we're currently facing. Um, so, but I think what is exciting for me to be a part of this conversation is that these, as we re-envision a new future of, you know, being beyond this crisis and not going back to normal, but be go going beyond better than normal, is that there are already pathways that exist towards recovery, resiliency, and preparedness. And many of them lie in the stories that we see in Power to the People and hundreds of um, other examples where communities have literally started the transition of self-sufficiency towards energy sovereignty and food security. And so we need to look towards these communities that are already doing their part to uplift these and also uplift these examples of leadership because they are building the new economy um, that you know I wanna see. These are models that I wanna see as we work towards a just recovery. Um, these types of stories are the, the paint a picture of the future that I wanna see, the future that is actually here, the future that is now, um, so I think um, if, if we can lift up these stories and let Indigenous people speak to themselves, you know, there's amazing Indigenous media that's already out there telling these stories. So when you see them, please share and please uplift the stories of these amazing models of leadership, because I think this pandemic is the first of many crises that we will have to face as climate change um, continues, you know, once we're able to leave our homes it's gonna continue. And so we are, it's true, we are not all in the same boat, but we are in the same storm. And the storm of um, COVID-19 is the pandemic, but the mega storm is climate change. And so we really need to um, be in this together and figure out how to address the inequalities that this crisis has surfaced and go back to a better than normal scenario. And that is through holding governments accountable to their actions. Um, and we need to see an investment in renewable energy, the renewable energy sector and a transition technologies to support communities to transition now. But we also need to look at 
doing this through practices, practices of decolonization. And I think that is um, where I'm going to leave it. But I'm so thankful um, to be part of this conversation and I've been really uh, benefited by listening to all the other amazing women doing this, the work in the world. And it makes me feel less alone. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Hi, hi. Wow, thank you so much, um, Alina, for that incredible presentation and the amazing work that you're doing. And uh, to be sure that we will be supporting you in lifting up uh, Indigenous voices and all the different information you shared. And I've been looking in the chat section and just to remind folks that we are going to be collecting all the information from the speakers and um, sharing out a document with all the links we want you to support all the organizations from the speakers. We want you to contribute. We want you to be interacting with them. That's the point of these webinars is that we are in a movement together. We are using this time to come together. That's what this crisis and these multiple crises are telling us is that we need to collaborate and collect together. And I can't think of a better community to do that with. So thank you, Melina, for that really inspiring presentation. And now we're going to bring on uh, Dr. Julia Kim who's the program director from Gross National Happiness Center in Bhutan. She's last but not least. And then afterwards, we're gonna open it up for discussion. We're probably gonna go beyond our um, 90 minutes. And I hope for those speakers who can, we'll stay on, but we'll st still stay on for a bit for uh, some Q&A and a special closing. Thank you so much, um, Julia, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much, Osprey. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to hear the other uh, women on this panel. It's a real honor to be among such wisdom. And thank you uh, for inviting me and uh, for we can hosting this session. Uh, I wanted to bring a slightly different perspective on the conversation, which is about something that might seem a bit abstract, but it's about measuring progress and measuring our current economic system. And just by way of introduction to say that um, I'm a Canadian and uh, it was after my training as a medical doctor when I started to travel to other parts of the world, um, to going to Africa, working in South Africa during the HIV epidemic, I started to see a kind of contrast between what we would call less developed countries or developing countries and the developed countries. And when I went to work uh, at the UNDP in New York, I realized that there was a kind of assumption that developed countries, uh, countries that were wealthier in terms of GDP, were the model that we were aspiring to follow and that other countries needed to catch up. And I think this measurement issue and the, uh, the supremacy of GDP as a measure of success is a real issue that is um, important to look at as we have this conversation. So I also had a few visual aids, uh, some PowerPoints that I find might be a little bit helpful in conveying some of these um, concepts. And I, I hope that uh, they'll help give a sense of why measurement is important. So the story of gross national happiness in Bhutan uh, begins with a visionary king. And uh, maybe you can just click the, the next uh, spot. Uh, the fourth king of Bhutan said, uh, when he was asked by a reporter in the 1970s, uh, what is the gross national product of Bhutan? And instead of giving a, a small number or an answer, uh, he very wisely said, in Bhutan, gross national happiness is more important than gross national product. And what he was saying in that very um, uh, brief phrase was articulating that as this country was moving into the modern age and opening up to the world, as a young leader, he was only 17 at the time, he said the well-being of the people was more important than pursuing economic growth for its own sake. And it's very interesting that around the same time in the United States, um, Senator Robert Kennedy, who was on the campaign trail at that time, made a very similar conclusion um, there's a wonderful video online if you just look up Robert Kennedy and uh, GDP. He said gross national product measures everything except that which makes life worthwhile. So both of these um, historical figures criticizing this measurement at the same time um, historically. Next slide, please. So what is wrong with uh, GDP as a measure? Um, this, it's interesting, it's not a, a, a number that many of us would question or even think about where did the formula come from. Basically, it measures all marketed activity and it counts all of it as positive, regardless of its social or environmental impact. So for example, if you cut down all the trees in a beautiful uh, area, if you devastate the land in Alberta, as we heard from our previous speaker, in order to uh, bring the oil out of the land, 
all that is counted as positive regardless of its impacts. It also leaves out um, a lot of the things that we value, a lot of the things that we heard our earlier um, speakers talk about. So the care economy, the reproductive um, uh, value of work, a lot of women's labor, um, because it's not costed, doesn't increase GDP. A lot of the things that we know make life worth living, uh, the closeness of our communities, trust, our musicians, our creativity, nature when it's not being extractive, none of these will cause GDP to go up. So it's a problem because of what it measures and what it leaves out. Another important problem is that GDP per capita measures an economy's average income, but it says nothing about its dis distribution. So for example, many countries where GDPs continue to go up are continuing to become more and more unequal. And what's really interesting is that above a certain level of development, a certain level of GDP per capita, well-being of people reported in surveys doesn't continue to go up as GDP goes up. In the United States, it's actually flattened as GDP has gone up. And in some cases, well-being is going down. So it doesn't correlate with that. Um, perceptions of fairness or injustice is not captured in GDP. Also a sense of financial vulnerability. So as we've seen uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, there are lots of efforts to bring up GDP growth again, to stabilize uh, the markets. But that doesn't mean that people are less financially vulnerable. And also trust in government. In many countries, as GDP goes up, there's been a distancing and a lack of transparency and trust in the government, which in many surveys correlates very highly with how happy uh, people are in a country. So all of these things impact heavily on well-being and quality of life. Next slide, please. So a lot of people ask, what do we mean by happiness in GNH? You know, it sounds like such a fluffy term. How can you run a country based on happiness? And it's important to point out that in, in Bhutan, it's not uh, just a, a momentary fleeting feeling good. It's not someone complimenting you on your hair. So you're, you're feeling great that day. And then you spill the coffee on your shoes and your mood goes down. Clearly, you can't govern a country based on, on those fleeting feelings. Uh, so please, next click. This is a wonderful definition uh, from the first prime minister of Bhutan who brought the idea of GNH to the United Nations at a high level meeting 2012. And he said, true abiding happiness cannot exist while others suffer and comes only from serving others, living in harmony with nature, realizing our innate wisdom and the true and brilliant nature of our own mind. So a really profound definition of happiness that is obviously relational. It's not my individual happiness. It's my relationship to others and a, and a really amazing insight that we can't truly be happy if others are suffering around us. Uh, the importance of harmony with nature. And you might say our relationship to ourselves or to our highest self, our own innate wisdom. Are we connected to purpose and to um, realizing our highest potential? These um, are what would be seen as a goal of development, not economic growth and GDP growth for its own sake. Next slide. So how is happiness measured in Bhutan? Uh, there are nine GNH domains, uh, which are seen as creating an enabling environment for happiness. So the government can't make you be happy. And in Bhutan, although people often come with very uh, kind of um, idealistic ideas, everybody must be happy in Bhutan, they would be the first to point out that's not the case, but the government is working towards creating an environment where people can flourish and be happy. So there are these nine domains. Uh, Click again, please. And it's not just about limitless economic growth for its own sake. Next click. It's really about balancing both the tangible and intangible dimensions of well being. So you could say the material aspects and the inner human aspects of what make us, makes us happy. So you'll see if you go clockwise around that dial, um, starting from uh, 12 o'clock, living standards, education, and health are the building blocks uh, for most societies and most surveys measure this. Um, so obviously people need to be able to have an adequate income, uh, education and good health care, good health. Everybody would uh, see that as being important. But beyond that, Bhutan also measures um, environment, uh, community vitality. So how much do we know our neighbors? Do we trust? Is, is there a sense that people would help you at a time of crisis? Um, some of our earlier speakers were talking about um, uh, the gift economy of um, 
volunteering and donation that's measured in the survey under community vitality because it's seen as a very important part of creating a society that's flourishing. Time use, which is something that we, many of us can relate to, also fundamental as a sense of our well-being. Are we all rushed off our feet? Do we have time to spend with family and friends? Also an important resource to be measuring. Psychological well-being, obviously important. Good governance, so trust, transparency. Are people voting? Are they uh, showing up at election time? Uh, these are also important for a sense of well-being. Cultural diversity and resilience, often not seen or measured in most national surveys. Uh, in Bhutan, they would ask, do you speak your local language? Do you know the traditional stories and folk dances? Uh, can you uh, remember uh, your great-great-grandparents' names? These are seen as important uh, passing on of heritage, which is also uh, fundamentally important for a country's sense of well-being. Um, so again, all of these are seen as interdependent, not one of them more important than the other. Living standards or the, the most economic indicator is not prioritized above everything else. It's seen as one component of creating an environment where people can be happy. Next slide, please. Uh, and maybe you can click that one also. And just, um, so how is it applied in Bhutan? If you start with this vision, of well-being and happiness as a goal of development, you need to know whether you're going in the right direction and you need to know whether it's being applied. So the survey I mentioned with the nine domains and 33 indicators is undertaken roughly every three years in the country by the Center for Bhutan Studies and GNH Research in order to know whether the country is moving in that direction. And you can look at the population comparing men and women, rural and urban to see how they're doing in those nine domains and where are people falling behind? Obviously, the measures themselves are not enough. Um, government policy needs to also be aligned with that direction. So there's a GNH screening tool that is used to guide policies that government looks at. So for example, um, a mining policy would be looked at not just in terms of how much uh, income will it bring or how many jobs will it produce or just whether its impact on the environment will be good, but what will its impact on culture be? What will its impact on health be? all those nine domains in order to see whether it should be passed or whether it needs to be sent back in order to be improved. Um, some interesting policies along that line uh, that have uh, really helped to align with GNH. Example, um, in the survey, uh, in the environmental part of the survey, there's a question that asks, uh, do you believe that nature is the domain of, um, is nature sacred? It is, is it the domain of spiritual guardians? And in Bhutan, there is a strong connection to nature as being sacred. And so that question isn't asked randomly. It's really to get a sense of whether as the country modernizes, this reverence for the land is still being kept. Do people still make uh, offerings to protective deities around their mountains? And it's interesting that Bhutan, unlike its neighbors, uh, Nepal, um, did not open up their mountains to uh, um, mountaineering. It has some of the highest um, unclimbed peaks in the world because uh, mountaineering was banned, I think largely because of this view that this is a, a sacred space. So again, that important connection between the values and the understanding and the traditions of people and how it's implemented in policy. So this, despite the fact that mountaineering and tourism is one of the biggest income uh, generators in the country, that there is some regulation. Similarly, they have high value, low impact tourism, where they're trying not to just open the doors to as many tourists as possible, but trying to preserve nature and environment. Um, Bhutan people may also be aware in their constitution says they will maintain at least 60% of the country under forced cover for all time, an extraordinary commitment. And it's probably one of the reasons that Bhutan is the first carbon negative country in the world. It's not only putting, not putting out um, carbon emissions into the atmosphere, through its forest, it's absorbing and taking in uh, more carbon than it's putting out. So the importance of that alignment with vision, measurement, policy, and then action, applying GNH in daily life. And that's where the GNH Center Bhutan, my, my NGO in, in Bhutan is really working to uh, bring these ideas into business, education, working with youth groups, not just in Bhutan and internationally, 
so that as Bhutan, which is starting to uh, become more and more uh, globalized and getting more connected through social media, as it continues uh, to move forward, it does not lose this very in important vision and value. Next slide, please. So I wanted to um, conclude by mentioning some of the programs that we're doing for those who might be interested in learning more about this. Uh, the Right Livelihood and GNH program is a collaboration between Canada and Bhutan. It's the first time we're trying to bring this to uh, Canada. And we're doing a program that will launch online in November um, in a beautiful uh, ancient Acadian forest on the east coast near Halifax called uh, Windhorse Farm. You can see the, the link there. And we'll be bringing a, a group to Bhutan for a week. And then they'll be prototyping and trying out the ideas in their own context. And then we'll reconvene in Canada um, to look at what people have been able to do. There will also be a, a shorter weekend retreat for those who can't make the whole program in the first weekend of August. And again, it's the idea of how do we translate this experiment that Bhutan has brought to the world and apply it in other places. So um, maybe if we can uh, just take the slides off, I'd also like to offer a few concluding thoughts. Um, you know, Bhutan may sound uh, exotic and unique and something that can only happen in this rarefied Himalayan kingdom. But in fact, there's a lot of initiatives that are happening now that are looking at what we would call beyond GDP measurements. Um, if people are interested, look up uh, Wellbeing Economies Alliance, or the shortened version is We All. And it's an amazing group that is uh, bringing in governments of countries that are now committed to measuring uh, what matters. And it includes Scotland, Wales, Iceland, for many may, many may know that New Zealand has put together a, a budget based entirely on, on well-being. So other countries are moving in this direction as well. Um, I think another thing I'd like to, to mention is that in our programs, we really look at the inner and outer dimensions of well-being. So not just um, changing the system outside through measurement, but also looking after our own well-being as people who are on this path. A lot of my friends and colleagues who are working in the environment or climate movement, working to challenge <clears throat> social injustice are burning out and uh, getting discouraged. So how do we build a community and resources to look after ourselves as we go forward? And the second element of the inner work I think is that measurements alone and systems change alone has never worked. You know, we're the ones who create the world. It comes from our own hearts and our own minds. So the, so the extent that we transform our own consciousness and decolonize our minds and um, delink ourselves from this uh, culture of uh, constant distraction on social media and devices and this constant addiction to consumerism and this sense that we're not enough, that we need more and more, that requires a kind of inner cultivation in the face of the onslaught of all the influences that we face. So a lot of our programs are also working on how do we work on the inner transformation of ourselves as leaders in our communities, in our organizations, in our own um, homes, so that we start to embody this new economy because it won't just come from outside. It has to be grown from the inside and it starts with us. So I'd like to end with those words and um, thank you again, uh, or Oriel, for um, inviting me and for being part of this uh, amazing group. Thank you so much for that really inspiring uh, presentation, Julia. Really powerful to see, and some of the, you know, the the spectrum of everything from the spiritual relationship to the practical application. Really, really amazing. Um, I know that we've run over time, and I want to be very respectful of the speakers and everyone who is in our audience. Um, I also know that this is such an amazing moment that we are together. So anyone who needs to leave, I really don't want to hold you back. Speakers have very, uh, you know, important um, other activities are engaged in. But for anyone who can stay, I would love to just invite our audience to pop in some questions if you have them, and we'll just stay a few more moments. Um, and if the the speakers also wanted to give, just give a final closing comment, that would be fine as well. Um, so. Uh, we're, we're just seeing different questions coming in um, around, um, we can look in the chat here, you know, I think there was a question around, you know, moving out of um, an endless economic growth system. Some of you might want to address that, like, you know, some of the practical applications of that. 
um, how we move to a different sort of model completely. And also, um, I think that it's important to, to also say that, um, as many of our speakers did, that we really cannot separate out, um, you know, these crises of um, neoliberal capitalism, racism, and, um, you know, the attack on indigenous peoples and their lands. And how we get through and navigate this moment, I think, is something that's a really practical thing that we need to keep bringing into the conversation. And I'm glad that's been highlighted as well, as we also see that there's all these new systems that um, are already being put in place, that people are already on the ground demonstrating these new systems. And I think one of the things that we need to address is that I'm so inspired about what, what people are doing on the ground, what women are doing, what many folks in the gender spectrum are doing in terms of actualizing this change and what communities are doing. And I think one of the biggest problems is the interference from the powers that be that are interfering with uh, the movement forward that people want on the ground and this real discrepancy between the elites and white supremacy and those in power and what everyday people want and are already demonstrating. So I think it's a combination of both sort of fighting off and dealing with this struggle with changing um, you know, the dynamics around uh, uh, our struggle with corporations and challenging corporate power and lifting up frontline communities, indigenous communities, communities of color, and all these visions coming from around the world. So I think that we, we have, you know, um, dual fronts to operate on. And I just also wanted to highlight again that we do have the feminist agenda mm -hmm. for a new deal where we're bringing all of these ideas together that is a global agenda. So we can go ahead and post that again for folks to look at that. So I'm just going to go um, through, you know, just kind of go through the speakers again in the sequence and give them an opportunity to, to answer some of these, these questions that have come in about degrowth around, um, you know, some of the practical applications of the work that you're doing. Um, I'm trying to just quickly just give the speakers a little bit of what I'm seeing in the chat. That was some of the questions that we saw coming up. And I'll keep looking into the chat as um, the speakers are, are going through their final comments and responses. Um, so I'm going to just go in the order that we started with, go through Ruth, um, Cindy, Ellen, and Melina. I know um, you may or may not be able to be here. So if you need to leave, let me know. We can put you right up front right now. And then to Julia. And then uh, I just want to mention to close out, uh, I've learned that Julia is an amazing musician and she has kindly um, offered to do a short closing on her beautiful violin at the very end, just so we end with um, a cultural practice that is very beautiful um, of, of music that she does. So I wanted to let folks know that that's happening. But um, Melina, if I don't see a message from you, I'm just gonna put you in the order that you're speaking. And uh, we're going to go to Ruth, then Cindy, then Ellen, Melina, and then close out with Julia. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Let's go ahead uh, back to you, Ruth. Hi again. Um, it's been wonderful to listen to everyone. I feel very pri privileged to have been part of the presentation, but also just to listen to the depth and tenderness of all the presenters. So uh, just in closing, I'm just going to address one thing. I think the question of who should the economy serve is very important. And I think it builds up on the kind of liberating visions uh, for the economy that we actually want to have. I think as, as has been said, um, the purpose is not growth for the sake of growth. The purpose is not to create things, to create food, to, to, you know, to farm for the sake of farming, um, to have things for the sake of having things. Um, we need to think through the kind of social relations we want to have with ourselves, we want to have with our community, we want to have with the land. These are extremely essential and important. Otherwise, to sort of end up in another cycle where even in our liberated world, we still replicate the same systems of waste that we have in this economic system that we presently have. So it's important to think, who should the economy serve? 
what does the economy serve? It serves us, it serves the people, it serves the community in regenerative ways. So that is what I would say in terms of um, the economy. So it's not just um, an economy for the sake of an economy. It has to serve a purpose. It, ha it has to serve a meaningful regenerative purpose. And so in terms of a final um, parting shot for me, I go back to, I've been, I critically, to be in the last few years, I've been practically obsessed with an idea of how do we build transnational solidarities amongst different people? How do we think about a borderless feminism? A borderless feminism, not because the borders that we have, and borders I don't mean in terms of like the fictional colonial borders that have been given, but I mean in terms of the borders around the differences that we, the, the differences that we have in terms of class in terms of race even though it is a it, it's a social construct but the consequences are very material for all of us but how do we build a borderless feminism that pays attention to the differences that we have but at the same time transcends them so that is the question that i'm going to leave all of us with i don't have a perfect answer for it it's something that I learn every day from the communities and from my comrades that I'm part of and from the movements that I'm part of. But I strongly believe that it's something we can always aspire to. It centers a form of visioning, you know, that basically allows us to learn. And if we allow ourselves to learn and to learn in a space of tenderness, um, then anything is possible in terms of a radical new world. And one of my favorite quotes about solidarity is something that the Sandinistas um, used to say. So the Sandinistas used to say that solidarity is the expression of the tenderness of the people. So I like to think about solidarity in that sense. That's how we show each other tenderness. So um, thank you very much for having me on the um, on this wonderful webinar. Thank you, Osprey. It's always a pleasure to see you, although virtually now, it's always a pleasure to see you, to be part of weekend events. And thank you so much for every single person on this panel. I feel very honored to have listened to you, to be have been in virtual community with you. And to all the, to everyone who came to listen to us, such a beautiful honor. And I hope for tenderness, I hope for liberation, I hope for freedom, and I hope for a new world. And I'd be very happy when all of us meet in that space of liberation very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. It's such an honor to have you here for your wisdom. And thank you again for, for staying up with us late at night and for your time. Thank you. And we'll go to Cindy. All right. Um, so awesome to be on this um, international webinar with uh, my sisters and kinfolk. Um, I think I just want to leave with one, one thought, right? I think one of the strategic imperatives of our time is to continue building the multiracial, intergenerational, multigendered grassroots feminist leadership um, in our movements. Um, because I think we can no longer, um, this, this, you know, this uh, century has really shown us we can no longer be siloed and we need feminism everywhere uh, as long, and, and we need to challenge uh, racial uh, capitalism um, from our localities all the way uh, globally. And I think that um, we know that grassroots feminists are fighting the bad and building the future and experimenting. And I think we need to be able to, again, lead with vision there's no no thing that is much that, that, I, that I will leave you with is that we have to be able to uh, begin to create the path forward um, that builds and, and, and imagines and makes real the regenerative feminist economy um, in our communities and our collectives. And I think that um, that uh, I share Ruth's uh, dream of creating this movement on an international level. And I think I believe that, um, you know, with a, this pandemic and these crises can't, um, can't take away our, our radical hope. And I think that's what's important, no matter what, is that that's what we have to hold on to. And part of that is, is all everything you've heard here and beyond. So thank you all, um, really honored. And I have to leave, but thank you so much sisters and kinfolk um, for having us on here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you for your radical work and hope and we'll continue to work together in collaboration. Thank you. And now we'll go for a few brief comments from Ellen and Melina and Julia and we'll close out. Thank you.
I, I, well, she, one thing I've really taken from this is just a, a sense of excitement and hope that, that people are really working on change. Because if you just read the news, you get the sense that, oh, it's just more of the same. It's the same rich people getting bailed out, et cetera. So, I, so I, I, it was great to, to hear all the speakers. I want to address the question of uh, perpetual growth and why do we have this push for growth all the time. Uh, two reasons. Well, take businesses. They either fund themselves by borrowing from a bank at interest, or they fund themselves by selling their by uh, going public and selling stock on the stock market. And both in both cases, you've got profits being sucked out to people who have no actual interest in the business. But you have to always continually be producing more. Well, take the 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 uh, situation of the bank. Since money is created as a debt, and it's extinguished when the debt is paid off, just like you picture a community community currency where you've got, you create money when one person does something for someone else and they just write numbers. If it's a digital one, you just write numbers up. Uh, and then when that person gets repaid, it all zeroes out and it's fine. Everything comes out, it balances out. But in the private money system, it's always created at interest. So that means there is, and nobody creates the interest. So there's always more money owed back than was created in the original loan. So you have to get that money somewhere. So that's the need for exploitation. You've got to get out there and take somebody else's money that was created as a debt that didn't include the interest. So there, there's debt just grows and grows and grows. And there's this continual scramble to try and pay it off until it can't be paid off and the whole thing collapses. And, and that's a system we have. Or if you decide to go public and sell stock, then it's the same deal where you continually have to be um, making profits, extra money that goes out of your little collective system in order to pay off these um, owners who have no interest. You know, they don't know you, they don't know the workers. They don't really care if they exploit the workers. They don't really care about the environment. That's, I mean, it's a, you know, ordinary people are in the stock market. They don't even know those things. They don't know what's happening to the workers in the business. They don't know what's happening to the environment around, around that particular business. So to fix that, if you have public banks, first of all, the profits go back to the people. So it's like a community currency where it's a, a closed system and all the profits are kept within the local community. Um, and for instead of selling your stock off to shareholders, if you have collectives um, that where the, own, the owners are the workers, then it's the same deal where the whole the profits are retained within the community, so you can keep that all all uh, sustainable. And also, if you have, let's say you have a public bank, you you will you need to have some sort of governance rules, like put it in the charter. It's good. it will make this this that and that type of loan. It won't make whatever you don't want it to make that harms the local economy. Um, and Again, you, you want to make it something sustainable. So, so you can invest. There are many things you can invest in. Let's say you had a, a um, quantitative easing for the people, like money just dropping from helicopters. You can, there are many things you can put it into that are not growth, that are not uh, ex using up more resources. It, first of all, if people have more money to spend, 80% of people are in debt. So the first thing they're going to do, hopefully, is pay off their credit card debts. You know, pay off their student loans, et cetera. Pay off their debts because because they need some savings. They're, they're either going to pay off their debts or save the money. They're probably not going to rush out and spend it for things they don't really need. So they're not going to add to you know that useless economy, you know, useless economic growth. And the money that goes to pay off debt will extinguish the debt, and it will disappear. So it will not be inflationary. Um, that's, that's really, that, that's, that's super helpful. So we understand how the public bank can actually be more like a commons in essence. And, yeah. and that's really powerful. Thank you so much. I know Melina needs to go. I'm sorry to, oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It, it's wonderful what you're saying. We need to keep going, but I wanted just to let Melina have her final comments. I know she needs to go and Julia, but thank you so much, uh, very much, Ellen. Melina, please go ahead. You're on mute. 
thank you, Osprey, and thank you again for all the amazing wisdom that all the women have shared from across the world. It's amazing to be a part of this discussion. I think one last point that I didn't have a chance to make was talking about how a decentralized um, energy system looks like so communities can become self-sufficient, especially in the face of future pandemics. Um, we need to ensure that there is not a um, a monopolization of renewable energy systems. So in, in, you know, in essence, no greenwashing. And so systems are not continued to um, follow the patterns of dominance, patriarchy and capitalism, um, which continue to put a stranglehold hold on community power and self-sufficiency and energy sovereignty. So yeah, that was one of the things that I wanted to say just because we need to encourage a continuation of um, robust um, renewable energy systems and policies that and, and allow these systems to flourish so that communities can become more energy sovereign. And I think that was a big, a big thing that we are pushing here in, in Canada, in so-called Canada, so that Indigenous communities can be owners of their own energy systems and not 1% owners, but 51% owners with um, other partners. And I think that's a perpetuation of um, dominance if we do not not see those energy systems have increased participation of marginalized or structurally oppressed communities. Um, so communities are owning their own power and not corporations once again owning the power if, even if it's renewable energy. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you again for having me. Thank you so much, Melina. Really appreciate it and good health and best wishes to you um, up, up in your territories. Thank you, more soon. And now we're going to uh, have Julia close us out with some amazing music because music brings us together. And I'm so deeply honored by your work, Julia, and the vision that you've shared with us today. And just wanted to give you the final say in a language that we all speak together around the world. Thank you, Julia. Thanks so much, Osprey. I think um, there's nothing much more to be said in words. I would just like to invite everyone to maybe touch into whatever they're feeling right now after having heard all of our amazing speakers, whether that's a feeling of joy or of grief or of not knowing what's coming next. I'm just going to be playing what I'm feeling. I'm going to improvise. And maybe as I play, the, I'd like to invite you to uh, maybe visualize what this post-COVID reality might look like. Because if we can't visualize it, we can't bring it into reality. So that's the invitation and I'll just play whatever comes to me. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. That was a perfect way to, to bring us all together and to help us to visualize where we want to go and also to feel our solidarity that we are together. And I could not be more thankful for all the women on the call and all of our audience for this very powerful session. And let's see it as a seed that's going to grow. 
and I invite you to continue to collaborate together, to collaborate with us as we build and shape the world that we know we need. This is our time. There could not be a more important time for us to make those changes. So with that, we're going to close out. And again, many thanks to everyone. Good health. Um, you know, we are in this together and know that we are thinking of all of you and this is our community and we can do this. Thank you. Thank you. Blessings to all.